book in reaction to Erasmus called The Bondage of the Will. Have you ever heard of that book? Okay. You know how there are certain works in, in history that address a certain issue and it's like, that's the primer on it. <laughs> I mean, anybody else who ever wrote or thought about it is in some way, shape, or form taking a bite off of that. Um, there was a work written uh, by John Owen, the Puritan, entitled The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. You've heard of that. Um, and uh, I think it's John Stott or J.I. Packer, I forget which, uh, actually wrote a summary of this massive tome written by this guy. But I mean, literally no one has ever added anything substantively to Owen's work on that. It's on the extent, the nature of, and the extent of the atonement, the death of death and the death of Christ. Well, the work that, that in the history of the church thoroughly nailed it on the effect of the fall on man's uh, spiritual nature, his soul, his spirit. What, what, what was the nature of the damage? In other words, the moral pathology. It was Luther's work entitled The Bondage of the Will, which was actually in response to some things that um, Erasmus had written. Notice the trend that often some of these great theological things, even with, with Tulip, was essentially in reaction to Jacobus Arminius in his errors. Similarly, Luther writes this massive work, The Bondage of the Will, that just puts it to bed forever in reaction to the errors of, of Erasmus. He, he said in a letter to Erasmus, or maybe it's in the preface to the book, which was addressed to Erasmus, I give you hearty praise and commendation on this account that you alone in contrast with all others, have attacked the real thing in advancing the humanist view. That is the essential issue, in parenthesis, sin. This is why that first doctrine, total depravity, which addresses the issue of sin and its impact on the human soul, is so important. You, you'll never understand salvation, which is obviously deliverance from the ruin of sin, if you don't understand the nature of sin. You see how important this is? So you had this pitched battle, by the way, in the fifth century between, you remember the, I said Pelagianism? There was a guy named Pelagius, who was a contemporary of Augustine, and they had this debate in the fifth, I mean, it was the theological debate of that whole century of the 5th century. And Pelagius uh, said that there is no responsibility without free will. That was his essential principle. You can't say that man is responsible to God if you cannot also say that man has a free will, an ability to choose, the power and the ability to choose. If I ought to do something, then I can, was the dictum of Pelagius. Which sounds reasonable, doesn't it? I mean, it has some logic to it. And that's where he got this idea that the, the will has to be neutral. It has to be free. The so-called power of contrary choice is the terminology in the world of philosophy. The freedom to choose good or evil and not be uh, predisposed uh, to either um, at any given moment. And so sin is only deliberate and unrelated choices for evil. You can see how that's also going to tend, if it doesn't completely annihilate the inward, the whole inward dimension, it definitely puts it in the background. That's exactly what the Pharisees did. They emphasized the externals. That's why Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. You're, you're all about externals, but inside you're rotten, dead men's bones. So the whole concept of original sin, the hereditary principle of sin, Pelagius, as we say, threw out the window, which implied we're all born like Adam before his fall, number one, and number two, we're able to live free from sin if we desire to do so and can do this even without an awareness of Christ and his work and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, Pelagius, because he professed to be a Christian, said, but, you know, 
Jesus and the gospel and scripture is the best help you can get out there to, you know, um, to give you a little assistance along the way. And so, by the way, this led, of course, to a denial of the absolute need of the unmerited favor of God and salvation. The will of man, not the will of God, is ultimate. So, Augustine, following Paul's concept of the nature, and he really milked that idea, especially in his Roman letter, but in other places as well. Paul's concept of the nature defi defined uh, the freedom of the will as the power to choose as one wishes, but in accord with one's character or nature. Um, I think I forgot this. I got behind him. <laughs> This pitch battle between Pelagius and Augustine. Now, that was one of your blanks. Did you pick that up in the 5th century? Um, Pelagius and Augustine. That's where, that's where these, these uh, various sides. And so Augustine followed Paul's concept of the nature, defined freedom of the will as the power to choose as one wishes but in accordance with one's character or nature. What um, what uh, he was saying, in effect, A. A, a. Hodge uh, summarizes uh, Augustine's view in his Outlines of Theology in this way. Ability, moral ability, is the power of an agent to change his own subjective state, to make himself prefer what he does not prefer, and to act in a given case in opposition to the coexistent desires and preferences of the agent's heart. Thus man is as truly free since the fall as before it because he wills as his heart pleases, but he has lost all ability to obey the law of God because his evil heart is not subject to that law, neither can it, can he change, as Romans 8, uh, 7 and 8 say. This is essentially the same thing that Jesus was saying in Luke 6, uh, 43 and following, when he said, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart, for out of the overflow of his heart his mouth speaks. So, in other words, it's very much the same idea that Paul develops as the, the sin nature. A and it's what David was referring to in Psalm 51 when he said, Surely I was sinful at birth sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Therefore, conclusion, though the, uh, the will is free in one sense, it's bound in another. It's free within the parameters of its nature, but it cannot leap the bounds of that nature unless, of course, God does a jailbreak. <laughs> to break us out of that nature. Uh, more on that in a moment. So, here's where we are. Total inability, I think that's one of your blanks, isn't it? Total inability means that fallen man cannot subject his mind to the law of God. That's is almost verbatim what Romans 8 says. The sinful mind is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature can not please God. So, the fallen man cannot subject his mind to the law, he can't please God, and can't understand the things of the Spirit, as we saw from 1 Corinthians 2. And he cannot bear to hear the Word of God. Jesus said in John 8, You are unable to hear what I say. You are of your father, the devil. 
I mean, the words can bang on the tympanic membrane and send neuron fi firings to the cerebral cortex, but ain't nothing happening. <laughs> uh, can't accept the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will give you another helper of the Holy Spirit whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Uh, cannot come to Christ unless the Father enables him. It's exactly what Jesus said, you remember, in John 6, 44 and 65. So, there you have it. This, this bondage applies to one's relationship with God, not with which brand of car I'm going to choose or toothpaste I'm going to buy. Okay? That's what we're talking about here in terms of the bondage of the will. We're not talking about that the human will is in bondage in every other possible way. I think I used the illustration before, and it's worth repeating here, that comes from Boyce. You remember in the animal kingdom there are carnivores, meat eaters, herbivores, plant eaters, and omnivores uh, eat anything. <laughs> and um, if you place hay or oats in front of the starving <coughs> lion, he'll, he'll not eat it, not because he, uh, someone is restraining him, but because he freely, freely chooses within his nature, he freely chooses, carnivore nature, freely chooses consistent with his nature, not to eat it. So for him to eat the plant food and be a herbivore, uh, his DNA would have to be uh, changed. And um, we are by nature, as we saw before, sinivores. We eat sin because it's consistent with our nature. And in order for us to eat righteousness, uh, our spiritual DNA would have to be changed. And that spiritual DNA change, here's the Bible word for it. The Bible word for the spiritual DNA change is the new birth or regeneration, uh, re-again, generate. Actually, not new birth. It's better new conception. In fact, the word doesn't mean birth like what happens in the birth canal when the child uh, is, is actually delivered, but it has to do with that original sperm and ovum uniting to generate a being. Um, so... <clears throat> That's what Nicodemus couldn't understand. Exactly. And he said, you know, I'm telling you this stuff, and you know what? You can't even understand what I'm telling you right now because you have to be born again to, to see, to, to blepo, to see the kingdom of God. Okay. In other words, to get a batting eyes glimpse. That's what blepo means. Boop! A, a, not, just, not a gaze, a glimpse. You can't even get a glimpse, <laughs> much less you know, a full, nice kind of, you know, stare at it and study it view. So sinful man, one of your blanks, is powerless to change his own nature. <clears throat> Job 14, 4. Who can make the clean out of the unclean? Obviously a rhetorical question. And the Jeremiah 13, the Ethiopian can't change his skin or the leopard his spots. So no one... Uh, no one has ever thought much of grace who thought little of sin. Here's the principle. Okay? This is kind of the summation of everything we've been saying for the last 45 minutes. <laughs> okay? You can kind of star this point. No one ever thought much of grace who thought little of sin. And here's the thing. Let me ask you. Is it possible to grow as a Christian without having a growing, expanding understanding of the grace of God? Is it possible? Can, in other words, can you attain unto a certain kind of plateau of understanding of the grace of God in the, in the gospel and just kind of leverage that for ongoing growth beyond that? Is that possible? Every incremental step of growth and spiritual maturity, everyone is fueled by some deeper, more profound, more uh, heart-endearing, mind-expanding, soul-enriching awareness of God's grace, which, which is uh, undeserved love and favor. And so, uh, and so what this means is, I'm sorry, we've got to understand sin more and more so that we get grace more and more so that we get growth more and more. See the connect? That's, that's how the, the doctrinal Legos... <laughs> are stuck together. Okay.
So <clears throat> it's only based on an understanding of our depravity that we can fully begin to appreciate the love of God displayed in his saving grace. Total depravity is so important. If we struggle with the other doctrines of grace, you know, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance, and saints, the problem usually stems from a lack of understanding of this one. Now, we've spent most of our time on that one, but let's, uh, let's deliberately, uh, but let's now go to the next one, unconditional election. Now, we've already looked at that some too, didn't we, back when we looked at the decree? Remember I told you some of these things are going to kind of overlap and interlock? Okay, we're back to that theme, but again, we're looking at it a little bit different uh, camera angle. Um, Michael Horton uh, said in one of his books uh, on the grace of God and the gospel, he says, grace is the gospel. The extent to which we are unclear about who does what in salvation is the degree to which we will obscure the gospel. In other words, what he's saying here, we've got to really understand what our part is and what God's part is. And the interface of those things. Um, or we will at least blur the edges of the gospel, if not distort the whole thing. So, um, in the doctrines of grace, we, look, we looked at limited atonement. Now we're looking at the you of the tulip, unconditional election. And we're defining it in this way. I think this is actually in your notes, this definition. That God, before the foundation of the world... By the way, this was accumulated from a number of different... Theologians. I took a little bit of this and a little bit of that in terms of their definitions and kind of hybridized them into this, uh, that God, before the foundation of the world, chose certain individuals from among the fallen members of Adam's race to be objects of his undeserved favor while others he passed by, his choice not determined by or conditioned upon anything that man would say think or do. And those two familiar passages obviously uh, reinforce that. Um, where it says that he that is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ chose or elected us in him before the creation of the world, which means long before we were ever born, we were before we were a glint in our daddy's eye, because our, daddy, our daddies weren't even around, um, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he's freely given us in the one he loves. In 1 Corinthians 1, he chose the foolish things, and Verse 28, he chose the lowly things. And, and uh, that repetition of his choice, um, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom, righteousness, holiness, and redemption. So, <clears throat> There are many evangelical Christians who are disturbed by the idea of God choosing who is to be saved. Why is that? What is behind that? Again, to paraphrase Horton, to give into election, we must first give up on ourselves in the matter of salvation. To whatever degree, folk, so, so if you're talking to a parishioner and you're kind of helping them get a grasp of, grasp of some of these things, you need to know the back story and why it's so hard for them to give in to the doctrine of election. Because, like all of us, we fight giving up on ourselves in the matter of salvation. Even when we know certain things we can talk the talk about the grace of God and everything, that grace penetrating to a deep heart awareness is our, is our big issue. And so, by the way, this 
giving in to election because we've given up on ourselves in the matter of salvation, that is, in a sense, a good definition of repentance. Remember the dual aspect of repentance? You turn from something to something else. Well, this turning from is giving, uh, giving up. I give up. I declare spiritual bankruptcy. I get out of the Savior business. I, I utterly collapse, helpless, without lifting a finger to, to recover myself, and I collapse into his arms. That's the positive side. I turn from myself, I collapse into his arms. So uh, you've heard it described that repentance and faith are flip sides of the same coin. They are actually the same thing looked at from two different vantage points. It's why it's hard to even talk about faith without describing some of the features of repentance. It's hard to talk about repentance about descri without describing some of the features of faith. They're hardwired. You really can't have one without the other. And I've read some people that it, it, they, the way they describe it is like, you know, you repent first and you repent enough till you can finally get to the place where you believe. If there is not faith in your repentance, it's not <coughs> repentance. You tracking on this? And this little statement, I think, of, uh, of Horton's is very helpful in that respect. All right. The biblical relationship between God's choosing and man's believing. Uh, remember we talked about the, uh, Horton says, the extent to which we're unclear about who does what in salvation is the degree to which we will obscure the gospel. So, uh, by the way, God does not actually do the believing for us. We do the believing. But, notice the way it puts it in Acts 13, 48. As many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. So you understand, it's like John 10, 26, but you do not believe because you're not of my sheep. <laughs> so you've got to be one of his sheep in order to believe. Um, and <clears throat> some are chosen and some are passed by. Um, th there's, there's a difference between God's choosing people to be saved and his choosing they're not to be saved. The choosing not to be saved is a different kind of an animal. And we need to understand that distinction. Um, because there are people who say, well, you know, that's not fair for him to choose this and, and, and pass by that. But uh, that's true, it, it isn't fair. <laughs> I mean, fair means just. Uh, and we get, if, if we get what we deserve, we get what's fair, then everybody is wiped out. Uh, everybody goes to hell. So it's above and beyond fairness. <clears throat> it's mercy and grace. It's above and beyond fairness. It's mercy and grace. We're going to talk about how, in a sense, it is fair. But we're talking about how, in a sense, it's not fair in the sense that it doesn't originate from God providing something for us that we deserve and therefore he's obligated. That's, that's the idea. If God were only just, all would be in hell. Um, but the claim of injustice, the charge of injustice or unfairness can only be made when one has a claim on another. If he owed salvation and failed to give it, that would be injustice. That would be unfair. But he owes no one. All have rebelled against him. And the whole thing is to the praise of the glory of his grace. He is not only just, but he is also merciful and gracious to save some, none of whom deserve it. Uh, J.I. Packer said, God owes sinners no mercy of any kind, only condemnation. Thus, it is no injustice if he does not resolve to bless them, but it is a wonder of free grace when he does. 
So the conclusion from all this is that salvation is a gift. That's exactly what Paul calls it um, in, um, in the book of Romans. Salvation is a gift from God, not a duty of God. All right, so <clears throat> continuing this idea of election, we've got predestination with these two sides to it, right? Um, his choosing unto life, that's election. And it's described in Romans 9, 6, of uh, it does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy is actively intervening in the hearts of sinners, in the hearts of those that are spiritually dead without his intervening. And then his condemnation unto death, that's reprobation. So one is election and reprobation is described in the very next verse, Romans 9, 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So this is the, uh, it's also described there in Romans 9 as his hardening, uh, which is essentially uh, God's passively giving sinners over to their sin. Um, they're, they're already hardened, but what uh, God does is he removes the restraints on their sin uh, in such a way that they are, are um, hardened in it. So it's, it's, it's almost a prejudgment judgment of uh, um, passing. Uh, and so they end up being condemned, not because he passed by them, but because of their sin. All right, let's take a break. Yeah. Is retribation the same thing as double predestination? Yeah. Okay. But we use a, a, a separate term for it because the scriptures itself uses a different term. Okay. It describes passing by as opposed to uh, that word to elect or to predestined or to choose. God seems to protect that phraseology for his salvific side. And he keeps this passing by or passing over um, the, uh, the non-elect as a description of uh, his condemnation of the non-elect. The obvious implication is we all deserve to be left in reprobation. Oh, yes. Um, so... But still, at the end of the day, that's just tough, you know. We want to carve out some little corner of being in charge, being in control, uh, having a leg up on this somehow. We, well, I think we've all been raised with the idea that we ha all have certain rights. Oh, and yeah. And when we start insisting on our rights, then all of a sudden this thing of the unfairness pops up. I've often thought that there are embedded a certain uh, cultural assumptions. Uh, that Cultural assumptions are things that no one ever even stops to examine. It's kind of like asking the fish about water. Nobody asks the fish about water. He doesn't know anything else but water. And so to ask an American about entitlement and my rights and to even challenge that we have them, I mean, I was listening to a discussion today they were, that th these guys were debating about, um, you know, free speech and the demonstrations about not... Um, and and so they were saying, Here's, here, here, you're not, you cannot exercise free speech to just l lambast people with the N-word. Did you know that? You can, you can end up in civil rights uh, suits if you just go around, well... There's an exercise of, quote, freedom of speech, but it's restricted, isn't it? But we don't think about people's uh, free speech being restricted in the 
the horribly offensive. It's every bit as offensive. I mean, if a guy's had both of his limbs blown off and protecting that flag, and these people out there are essentially spitting on it, let me tell you, that is every bit as offensive as spitting into the face of a black man and calling him, a, I don't even want to say the word, the N-word, if not more so. It's every bit as offensive. But, but you know why we don't, in our culture, we don't, and, and I hear this debate on the radio and I'm thinking, excuse me, can, does it, can anybody point out that our forefathers that mapped out these incredible civil liberties always imagined that every single one of them, including freedom of speech, had boundaries. It was not unlimited freedom of speech. But look at the ridiculous lengths we've taken it. You know, pornography is defended in the courts under uh, the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Freedom of speech yeah. Can you imagine the founders of this country? They'd be pulling their hair out, rolling over their graves, screaming and running through the streets. What are you doing? But almost no one in our society thinks that way about these things. And, and here's why. Because freedom has been redefined, not as the power to do what I ought, but the license to do what I want. And so what we've done is we've taken our Constitution and codified anarchy. We've made anarchy the high and holy God, almost, of our body politic and our understanding of our history and our founding and our roots. And so, you know, the book of Judges, every man does that which is right in his own eyes. No wonder we've got crazy anarchy. No wonder we've got the stupid neo-Nazis on one side and the, the stupid Antifa group on the other. By the way, they're both cut out of the exact same bolt of cloth. There is fundamentally no difference from either group. They're both anarchists. <laughs> and they're, they're locking horns with each other. And, and, and I apologize and, for getting him started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but isn't that the, the application of all yeah. of this that we've yeah. been seeing in terms of when you don't understand total depravity, man, you're groping in darkness. You don't have any moorings. And you come up with the most silly, juvenile, ridiculous worldviews. And society just grinds down into this kind of pathetic, sort of aberrant, aberrant mutant kind of a, of a monstrous thing. It becomes monstrous. If you don't understand the monstrosity of sin, you will be the, the, the monster. <laughs> <Whew. clears throat> It's important stuff, isn't it?